Hello and welcome back to Cultural Geography. So I'll be making video lectures to accompany the chapter in your textbook. This video will highlight some of the key points in the chapter, but not all of them. So it's your job to be responsible for the materials covered in the textbook, as you'll be quizzed on this as well. So today's lecture is more about definitions than it is about applying concepts to real world examples that we've done in the past. So on that note, let's get after it. So we've already defined culture, but culture is the body of customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits that together constitute a group's identity. So establishing a working definition of culture is important because we can then ask, why is culture important to a society? So what is a society? So a society is the aggregate of people living together in a more or less ordered community. So while there's many definitions of this society, I like this one because it seems to sum up what we're talking about here in terms of cultural geography. So the concept culture and society are closely related. Culture is defined as all the products of society, material and non-material. Society consists of interacting people living in the same territory who share a common culture. So when you have a moment, Think about five things that define your culture. You don't need to turn this in, just think about it. What would define your culture? So culture is shared. So to be a member of society means sharing a culture. In this sense, a society is more than the sum of its members. Membership in a society necessarily involves sharing a way of life, engaging in similar patterns of thought, in behavior, such as celebrating Thanksgiving in comparable fashion, or overspending before Christmas, or spending many, many years in school. Culture is learned. Human beings are not born with cultural patterns encoded in their DNA. No one is born Christian, English speaker, and an MP3 file user. All such patterns or behaviors have been learned, and the more complex the society, one lives in, the longer it takes to learn the necessary skills needed for a competent social participation. Accordingly, most members of this post-industrial society spend long years in the educational system, whereas members of the few remaining hunting and gathering societies have no need for formal education and rely on, on informal training. So, culture determines what we know. So the sum of all angles in a triangle that a screwdriver is used for, how to use a computer to find out where the closest gas station is, etc. And culture also determines what we don't know. How do you catch a fish by hand? How do you build a dugout canoe and navigate the South Sea without a chart or compass? So culture determines what we want to be. We want to be a lawyer, a dairy farmer, a computer programmer, a doctor, shaman, Turtle diver, culture is going to determine that. Culture as natural. Another important characteristic of culture is that we tend to take away or take our way of life as quote unquote natural. That is, we take it for granted and as if it's the quote unquote right way of doing things. We therefore rarely question our cultural assumptions. In a sense, culture is invisible to us. It just is the way things are. We don't think we engage in uh, special cultural practices when we buy items over the internet using a credit card, working out at a gym, or listening to music on CDs or DVD or on CDs or your iPod. These practices just seem natural. Cultural shock, because we tend to consider our culture as quote unquote natural, we often experience disorientation and discomfort when we confront other cultures which is a called which is known as a feeling of cultural shock so the greater the difference between the two cultures the greater the shock is so cultures cultural culture varies it varies with physical settings or geography so when i first moved to idaho from southern california i had never seen elk duck or deer stickers on the back of a vehicle before. It was totally foreign to me. And truthfully, it was a little funny. 
This reflects part of Idaho culture, which is not part of Southern California's culture. So I'm sure you can think of many examples of how culture varies. It also varies with time. Have you ever tried to read Beowulf, Shakespeare, work on a slide rule, drive a buggy, or understand Victorian morals and ethics? And to some extent, uh, it's varying over time in terms of having a two-parent household, stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, all these things are changing over time. So think of culture as a stream flowing down through the centuries from one generation to another. Each generation contributes something to that stream, but in each generation something is left behind. Some sediments drop off to the bottom and is lost to society. So kind of think of this, What a, and a good example of this probably in the more recent times, think of pagers. Was it back in the 90s everybody had pagers? That was the way to get hold of everybody, even if you weren't a drug dealer? But now pagers are kind of non-existent. Nobody has that. It's given away to cell phones. So we're going to talk here about high culture and popular culture. So high culture is the assumption, consumption patterns, mannerisms, beliefs, amusements, leisure activities, and tastes and preferences of a society's elite. So jazz, classical music, ballet, theater, these things are thought of as being high culture. High culture is not mass produced nor meant for mass consumption. So items of high culture often require extensive experience, training, or reflection to be appreciated. Such items seldom cross over to the pop culture domain. So popular culture is the consumption patterns, mannerisms, beliefs, assumptions, amusements, excuse me, leisure activities, and tastes and preferences of the mass of society. And that's the difference. One is for the elite, one is for the mass. So pop culture involves the aspects of social life most um, actively involved by the public. As the culture of the people, popular culture is determined by the interactions between people in their everyday activities. So styles of dress, the use of slang, reading rituals, and the food that people eat are examples of popular culture. Popular culture is also informed by mass media. So popular culture encompasses the most immediate and contemporary aspects of our lives. These aspects are often subject to rapid change, especially in a high technology world in which people are brought closer and closer by this omnipresent media. So certain standards and common held beliefs are reflected in pop culture. Because of its commonality, pop culture both reflects and influences people's everyday life. Furthermore, brands can attain pop culture or pop icon status, for example, think of Nike swoosh and McDonald's golden arches. Those are kind of iconic across uh, not only the United States, but the globe. However, iconic brands and other aspects of pop culture may rise and fall. And you might know some of these off the top of your head as well. Pop culture allows large heterogeneous masses of people to identify collectively. It serves as this inclusionary role in society as it unites the masses on ideals of acceptable forms of behavior. So along with forging a sense of identity which binds individuals to the greater society, consuming pop culture items often enhance an individual's prestige in their own peer groups. So pop culture is generally looked down upon as being superficial when it's compared to the sophistication of high culture. But this doesn't mean that social elites do not participate in pop culture or that members of the mass don't participate in high cultures. There are numerous sources of pop culture such as mass media, especially popular music, film, television, radio, video games, books, and the internet. So pop culture is also influenced by professional elites that provide the public with information. So folk culture is the traditional practices primarily by small 
homogeneous groups living in isolated rural areas. So as popular culture changes rapidly, folk culture changes relatively little over time. So folk culture refers to elements of everyday life in traditional, localized people that are immediately recognizable as belonging to that culture. So the Amish are a very recognizable folk culture in parts of the United States and Canada, especially the states of Pennsylvania and Ohio. Faith characterizes Amish culture, and Amish faith dictates nearly every aspect of the person's lifestyle. So important features of Amish culture are simplicity and the importance of family. To this point, we have been thinking of culture primarily from a non-material cultural perspective. That is to say, the ideas, beliefs, habits, and values of people. So, material culture includes all physical things that people create and attach meaning to. Clothing, food, tools, architecture, and so forth. So, natural objects and materials like rock, dirt, trees, and so forth are considered to be part of material culture. However, many people view natural objects and how they are how they use them are. So ethnocentrism is judging another culture solely by the values and standards of one's own culture, with the tendency for one culture to view itself as superior to another. And cultural relativism relativism is the practice of viewing a culture based on its own standards. So cultural relativism, I can't even say these words here, cultural relativism can be difficult to maintain when confronted by cultures who practice or believe conflict with your own. For example, in France, headscarves worn by many Islamic women have been banned. To the French, banning headscarves is important because it helps maintain a secular society and gender equality. But imposing these values on people with a different culture is ethnocentric and therefore has become controversial. So that ends this lecture on some key definitions that you should know. And on that, have a good day.